as I was seeking the Lord about what he'll have uh, us to deliver, praise God, we always seek God's face, see what he wants, and then proceeds to do it. We're messenger boys, praise God. He's the one who gives the directions. Jesus, if you have a red letter, red letter, red letter excuse me, edition. Jesus in verse 33. But seek ye first, underline, the kingdom of God, number one, and his, see, his refers to someone has this, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. And so the Lord directed me to minister today on provisions during tough economic times. Provisions during tough economic times. Now first he says, seek first of all the kingdom of God. You'll find in scripture, Jesus called himself the kingdom of God. Amen. Secondly, in scripture, you'll find that the kingdom of God is the righteous family of God. Thirdly, you'll see that the kingdom of God is God's operating systems on earth. There's a way in which God intended for us to operate and live on earth. And then lastly, when the scripture in the New Testament talks about the kingdom of God, it's talking about the third heaven where the throne of God actually is. Now he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, uh, amen. And of course, praise God, righteousness means or righteousness is about your standing with God. When you have a righteous standing with God, you are entitled to be treated by God as though you have never sinned. And it allows you to approach God on the basis as though sin has never been. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, he who knew no sin, that was Jesus, was made to be sin for us. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Meaning what? That when you receive Jesus as Lord, God will treat you as though sin has not been in your background. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One scripture says he throws the sin as far as the east is from the west and has no more remembrance of it. Glory to God. Somebody say, thank God for the mercy of God. Well, righteousness is not something you earn. It's righteousness is something you receive. We receive, Romans 5, it says, it is the gift of righteousness. Amen. You don't earn a gift. You accept a gift. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. Amen. Can I get three hallelujahs this morning? In 1 Kings chapter 17, we read about a very difficult economic scenario that took place with the nation of Israel, northern and southern kingdom. It says, And Elisha the Tisbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, we remember this guy last week, Ahab the king, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And so uh, Elijah didn't say that on his own. The Lord told him that, to say that. Praise God. And they are not going to have any precipitation, not even dew on the ground, for three and a half years. Now, you talk about drought. We've seen drought in California and other places here in the United States. Amen, where there's drought. And they talk about one year drought, how much devastation is the plants, how the economic problems then develop because of that, because there's, there's uh, no water, then there's the inability to produce the crops necessary, to, then there's nothing to sell, there's nothing to buy, there's nothing, no more seeds to plant. It produces serious economic harm. When you talk about three and a half years when you don't even have dew, I mean, not, nothing. There is no water. And you got to remember, they didn't have the type of 
purification and systems and water delivery systems we have today. So when you have three and a half years of drought, there's a serious problem even with water to drink for humans and animals. So you're talking about animal suffering, plant suffering, people suffering. When you have three and a half years of drought, what you have is mass death. People begin to starve. Amen. And so what you're talking about here, this statement here, is a serious death-written statement. It is a judgment that took place. Now, the, the first question you want to ask them, why? Okay. What is the reason that this took place? Well, praise God, turn to 1 Kings 16. As I've always told you, those of you who have, uh, I have been privileged to be pastor of for these 43 years, is that everything in the natural first has a spiritual origin. You look first to the spiritual stuff, then it will tell you why things happen in the natural. Well, here's the short-term answer, because there's a long-term I'm going to give you. But here's the short-term answer why this happened in chapter 16, verse 30. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Note above everybody else in front of him. And there were some seriously bad folk. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ephbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up or built an altar for Baal, built a house of Baal in Samaria. And Abraham made a grove, and Abraham did more, and you need to underline right here, he did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. And so he participated in, as we know, as the commandments that told his forefathers, thou shalt have no other God before me. So we have the idol God of Baal. He's going to marry a woman who is the number one supporter and chief of the worship of Baal, Jezebel. He's going to build temples for Baal. He's going to command the nation to what you do is that you forget about this Jehovah we were singing about today. You forget about this Jehovah and we're going to worship Baal. And he did it worse because this was done by some of his predecessors, but he did this worse than any of them to the point that he provoked God to anger. Judgment then came. And this judgment is what I talked about a few minutes ago. So, praise God, that sin, national sin, produced this economic result. Now, that's the short answer. Let me give you a fuller answer. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. Give me three more hallelujahs this morning. But how we got to this guy, okay, Goes all the way back to his great great grandfather. Why this nation got opened up to all this, and why they get into this position where all these people die? A lot of people died here because of this. Now, in First Kings, the eleventh chapter said, "But King Solomon, you remember who Solomon was? Solomon was the son of David. Solomon was the one who started out with with his heart." And when God says, I'll give you riches and long life and honor, he said, I don't want the riches, long life, and honor. I just want to be able to serve the people. God was so pleased, he said, I'm going to give you wisdom above any man ever on the face of the earth. And I'm going to give you what you didn't ask for. I'm going to give you the riches, the long life, and the honor you didn't even ask me for. Amen. Praise God. The queen of Sheba came, came to see him. The Bible said when she saw all that he had, his minstrels in front of him, the order in which things were done, the blessings of the Lord that was upon everything about him. It said she, that it took her breath away. 
She saw all that in him and she like fell out, baby. She went back, praise God, to her nation okay, and brought the gospel there. So this is the guy we're talking about, right? This guy has all this wisdom. But let's keep reading. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, meaning he was married to the daughter of Pharaoh. Women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go in unto them, neither shall they come in unto you. Why, surely these women will turn away your heart after their gods. But Solomon clave unto these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines. I say this boy was busy. <laughs> and his wives turned away that heart. Remember how his heart was? His wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. His heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. And Solomon went after Astoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, after Milcom, the abomination of the Amorites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill in front of Jerusalem and for Mo and Molech, you know, later on, Molech, Molech's going to be involved in sacrifices of children, killing of children for sacrifice, the abomination of the children of Ammon, and likewise did he for all, he did all this for his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrifice unto their God. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. The Lord appeared to him. So we see, even though you can be the wisest man on the face of the earth, you can still mess up. You can be the wisest person on the face of the earth and still have a way in which Satan can get at you. It's just different with each person. Are you listening to me? But all of us need the true and living God. Shout amen, somebody. This is what opened the door. Before Solomon and this part of Solomon's life, he didn't start out this way. But by the time he got old, this is where he was. This is what opened the door to idol worship. And what happened after him is that the king, I don't have the time to read it. If I had the time, I would take you all the way through it verse by verse. Amen. But this, the kings who come after him then are going to participate in much of the same. They're going to, there's going to be much idol worship, praise the Lord, that begins to take place. Take a look at chapter 14. And then not only did that open the door to that, it opened the door to something else. Verse 22 of chapter 14. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. And they provoked the Lord to jealousy with their sins, which they committed above all that their fathers had done. It gets worse with each generation. See, each generation gets more and more away from God, more and more to sin. Amen. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every hill, and under every tree, every hill, every tree. And there was also Sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So I guess we better, we better find out what that was. 
because it talked about the evil that they did and then there's the word and. See, so here's, here's evil, one set of evil. Here's another set. Uh, amen. And there were also South Sodomites in the land. This got opened up because of moving away from the true and living God. So now let's read a little bit about what the word has to say about Sodomites and Sodom. Turn to Leviticus chapter 18. Praise the Lord. I need three praise the Lord somebody. The 18th chapter of Leviticus and we'll begin reading here with verse 22. It says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Now the Hebrew word for abomination means it is abhorrent in the Hebrew. It is abhorrent and that it is disgusting. Praise the Lord. Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 20. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter. We read here in, in verse, uh, praise God. Oh, that's, that's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 23, verse 17, it says, there shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. This was something that was forbidden by God Almighty. And they didn't allow it. Until the door got open, starting with Solomon, and then proceeded further. We say, oh, well, that's an Old Testament thing. Well, let me read you some New Testament stuff. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Praise the Lord. I'll give you a few New Testament. If I had time, I can give you a whole lot more. But here in Romans chapter 1, we read here in verse 20. Well, I'll tell you why they are. Uh -huh. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold or suppress, that's the word hold, they suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is apparent unto them. God showed it unto them. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. All the stuff he made with his hands, all the skies, the, the moon, the sun, the human body. It's how wonderful and intricate and how God's done everything. Praise God. Hallelujah. The invisible things of him clearly seen. Understood by the things that I made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that we don't have any excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God and they were not thankful, but they became foolish or empty in their imaginations or discussions of the words, their imaginations. And their foolish heart became dark. See, that's what happened to Solomon. His heart was light moved away from God because of what happened with those women and his heart became dark. He never repented. See, he was different than his father. His father made an error, but his father repented. And God treated his father as though his father never sinned. Solomon never repented. And he's going to die this way. We'll keep on reading. Professing themselves to be smart and wise. They became fools and stupid. Changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like made to corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things. We saw that. God also gave them up. He also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who changed the truth of God. That truth of God is male. There's male and there's female. Ain't no in-between. and worship and serve the creature, their lust and their human flesh, more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Because of this, God gave them up unto shameful affections. Even their women did change the natural use, because that which is against nature. Instead of women desiring men, women start desiring women. 
is called vile affection. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the women burning their lust towards each other. Men with men working, working that which is shameful and receiving in themselves the reward of their error as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind is a mind that has no good judgment. A reprobate mind will make you say that a man can be pregnant. When your eyes can clearly see a reprobate mind, a mind with no judgment, will make you see a woman clearly cut to receive a man. And that a man is clearly designed to enter a woman. A reprobate mind will make you see that and decide that that is not good. In other words, it is a lack of judgment and it is reprobation. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching to you. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. In 1 Timothy, praise his holy name. Now, the children of Israel went along with that stuff with Solomon. And it led to where we got to the place of national judgment. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10 says, actually, we're back on verse 8. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for men slayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind. Now, the, the Greek here for the term defile themselves with mankind is arsenokortai. It's the Greek word. It means men who sleep with men. Hallelujah. For men stealers, liars, perjured persons, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, not sound doctrine, sound teaching, anything other than a man is supposed to be a man designed to be with a woman. Now, the sin of sodomy or homosexuality was considered normal behavior in the pagan nations of Canaan. This is why God told them, he said, I don't want you mixing with them, he said. And when he sent them into the promised land, he said, I want you to rid of them. It's right there in the book. God commanded them to destroy them. They didn't. Partially disobedient. To God, however, this is one of the most grievous of their abominations. Turn to Genesis chapter 18. The 18th chapter of Genesis, praise God. And verse 29. You might remember this story. Abraham or Abraham is interceding with God. God says, I'm going to destroy Solomon and Gomorrah. And Abraham said, but hey, wait a minute. Now I'm supposed to be 50 people in this, righteous people in that city. You can't do that. And God said, all right. He said, well, suppose there's 45. He said, I won't get verse 29. He said, suppose there's 40. Right? We get all the way down to 10 about Solomon and Gomorrah. He said, suppose there are 10 righteous people in the city. The mercy of God says, if there's only 10 in this entire region, I will still spare everybody. The problem was, he couldn't find 10. When you got to chapter 19 and you read verse 4, of course, two angels of God are going to go down to get Lot out of Sodom. When they get there, of course, they're going to stay at his place. And we read verse 4. But before they can even lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, circled the house. Old men, 
and young men. All the people from every part of the city. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are those men which came in to you tonight? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And they were not talking about conversation. And Lot went out at the door and, and shut the door behind him and said, now, look, 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 don't do something so wicked. He said, now look, I have two daughters. They are virgins. Here, take them. And they said in verse 9, get back. You're you going to judge us? Now we're going to deal worse with you than with them. And they came to break down the door. Of course, we know the flash power of God came blinded everybody. Lot got out of there. Hello, somebody. Amen. Then take a look at the book of Jude. Amen. That's the book just in front of Revelations, another one of them New Testament books. We know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. None but ash was left. Give you an idea what God thought about it. Now in the book of Jude, we can read over here, praise the Lord, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities round about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, gone after strange flesh, and set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So you can't be more plain than all of that. Now, I understand that when you preach what the Bible says, you will be called hateful, backwards, whatever. I didn't write the Bible. My job is just to believe it and preach it. Hallelujah. You'll be called all kind of names and so forth and so on. Just what goes on. In fact, preachers are afraid to preach it today. They won't even talk about it. In fact, some of them, praise God, are participating with it. 1 Kings 17, praise the Lord. Let's go over there. But 1 Kings chapter 17, however, so we, we saw that this incredible judgment takes place because of what was happening. We, we looked at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto that prophet saying, Get thee hence and turn thee eastward. Hide thyself by the book Sherith, that is before Jordan shall be. Thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. It's a lot in there. I'm going to keep going today. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. A lot in that, but I'm going to keep on going. And the ravens, verse 6, brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook, but after a while, the brook dried up, of course. Why? Because there's no rain. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get up, go to Zarephath, which belonged to Zidon. Dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now, Zarephath is a city between Tyre and Sidon called Sarepta. You actually read that in Luke chapter 4, verse 26. It is inhabited by Gentiles. God is going to provide for his prophet with an unclean bird because ravens were considered to be unclean, not touched by Jews, and by a Gentile who the Jews also considered to be unclean. She's a Zidonian. Now, Elijah then is going to be the first prophet of the Gentiles because this woman was a Zidonian just like Jezebel. And we know who Jezebel was. Now, let's keep on reading here. Mighty quiet in this first church of the fridge there. <laughs> Verse 10. And he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, there's a lot in the, he arose and went. I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot of, when I talked about number five last week, we could have used right here. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. He called her and said, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I might drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, and by the way, get me some bread too while you're going. 
Now, of course, how he knew this was the woman, she's at the gate of the city, and how the woman knew that he was the prophet. Okay, amen. Obviously, God was at work there. Amen. And he said, no, bring me a morsel of bread in thine hand. Now, verse 12 is really instructive. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth. She didn't say, as the Lord my God liveth. She says, the Lord your God liveth. Your God, not mine. As the Lord thy God liveth. I don't have a cake. I don't have any meal in, the, in a jar or, or, you know, or in a flask or in a cruise. And look, I'm gathering two sticks or I'm, just, I'm about to make a fire that I may go in and, and get ready that me and my son may eat it and die. We're about to die of hunger because there's famine. And there's famine here in this region because these people practice bow worship just like Ahab and Jezebel. And so since they decided to do the same thing that was happening in Israel, they got the same judgment. If you decide to follow the same sin as everybody else, then you get the same outcome that they have. Even if you know the Lord your God. Policy, where there's personal policy, is a, is, is a decision. National policy is a decision. All policies are nothing but decisions. All decisions, there is a law in the scripture, that is, there is a law of just result. Whatever you sow, you reap. Hallelujah. So you can make excuses for lots of stuff, but at the bottom, bottom line, you go to the word of God, and whether you're talking about somebody as an individual, or whether you're talking about a family, or whether or you're talking about a city, a nation, or a nation, or the world, it's all about decisions, whether the decisions were righteous or not righteous. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so, even though she was a Gentile, though, she understood the God of Israel. She said, she, she knew about it. She says, no, your God knows. I don't have anything. I'm about to. Now, it's interesting to note here also because the, the word of the Lord said that, that uh, to the prophet, to Elijah, I, that uh, I have told a woman there to sustain you. And I don't think the problem was that she didn't hear God. Uh, amen. I think the Lord was calling those things was be not as though they were. I'm coming to the end of the message in about 10 minutes. Y'all can hold on now. There's some good stuff at the end of it. Hello, somebody. <laughs> Glory to God. Uh, amen. You say, remember, people were not born again. Their spirits were not alive. Okay, amen. They had no contact with God except through the prophet, priest, and king. Okay, amen. With the anointing. Here we have a non-believer, a Gentile. Okay, amen. So I believe the Lord let him know this is who I'm going to use. Okay, and I'm going to let you know who I'm going to use. Amen. She recognizes he is one of them prophets of God. She talked about he is God. And now she has a decision. Because what God's going to ask her to do through the prophet, I want you, I want you to take that which you have during this tough times. All you got left. Let's read it. Elijah says something that seems to be very mean. She just said me and my son about to die. He's going to say something, boy, I would be criticized for for days. And Elijah said unto her, fear not. Go and do like you said, but you make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me after that you make for your son and, and yourself. So here you got a widow woman. That's all she got left. He said, now you make for me first. Whatever's left, y'all eat. After she told him, this is all we got, then we're going to die. I can see Channel 7 right now. <laughs> News at 11. <laughs> Glory to God, that butler told that woman. Hallelujah. 
He can just see it. But now she has a choice. She now has to pass the money test. If you really believe in this God, amen, then there's an action you have to take. If you don't, all right, she's got a choice. And you have a choice always. Say, I always have a choice. You always have a choice. Don't say you don't have no choice. You always have a choice. The word of the Lord was, but thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord send them rain upon the earth until this judgment is over. She decided. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and Elijah and her house did eat days. We know how many days till the famine ended. The barrel of meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Did you notice here? This is very much like what happened with Jesus. Jesus and his very first miracle, they ran out of wine, okay? His mama said, I want you to go help these folk. John chapter two, right? Go help these folk. And Jesus said, look, it ain't my time. I ain't supposed to be doing nothing yet. He, she said, y'all do what he tell you to do. That's mama for you. She ain't listening to that boy. She said, you go do what I say, right? So Jesus go be a good boy and obey his mama. And what, what do they do? They bring him those empty barrels. And praise God, <laughs> hallelujah, just full of water. And he said, now you take it and you go serve to the people. They had a choice. They could have went, this is water, this ain't no wine. And you can get us in serious trouble here. But they did what he said. And as long as they kept on dispensing, the water kept turning to wine. Now I want you to notice that God provided for that woman and God provided for her son and God provided for the prophet with the utensils of which she said we're going to die with. God used the very thing. He never gave her a whole lot of stuff, but every time, every time she went back to those utensils, it was full again. And every time she emptied it out, it was full again. It reminded me when I was a student in Bible school. Never had no money in my pocket, but every time all my bills got paid. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Till they were all paid off supernaturally. God wants to know what's in your hand. And he can use even in tough economic times which are coming. And he can use in tough those times, he can use what's in your hands to cause you to sail right on through it until it's over. Now turn to Matthew chapter 6. Let's come down the home stretch. Can I get three hallelujah somebody? That woman became someone of the righteousness of faith. Hebrews 11, 7. Now in Matthew chapter 6, let's back up instead of verse 33. Let's back on up to verse 24. No man can serve two masters. So a decision has to be made. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. But he cannot serve both God and money. That's mammon. So he has to make a decision. Amen. Decision has to be made. Do you serve what's in your financial interest? Or do you serve with God's interests? Are? That's what decision was. He said that you can't do both. Amen. Your decision cannot be, well, I'm going to do what's in my financial interest, forget about what God's interests are, or I'm going to serve what's in God's interests and trust God take care of my financial interests. But you cannot serve them both. You will have to make a decision. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought, underline that. Take no thought means don't worry about it. Glory to God. No worries. Hallelujah. No worries. No worries for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than clothes? 
Look at, the, look at the birds of the air. They don't have a job. They don't get a paycheck. They don't have a bank account. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you much better than a pigeon? Anybody here better than a pigeon? I hope you lifted your hand. If not, you got a problem with your thoughts. Hallelujah. Which of you, by worrying about it, can, can cause yourself to grow and get bigger and stronger? Worry don't do it. Worry cuts you down. Why? Why are you worried for clothes? Look at the lizards of the field, how they grow. They don't work. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon and all his wonderful, and you know that he looked good too, his glory was not arrayed like one of these. What are the things he's talking about? He's talking about the natural needs you have in life. Wherefore, if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the fire, shall he not much more clothe you, here it is, O ye of minimalist faith, itty bitty faith, hallelujah. When you have faith, you watch your mouth. I don't care how much gas costs. My God supplies my needs. I don't care what the interest rates are. I don't care how much food now costs. I don't care how much clothes now costs. I don't care. They can talk about economic downturn. They can talk about recession. They can talk about depression. And all of that might be true, but as for me, my God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory. Little faith, praise God, don't talk like that. Little faith says, look at the cover. I don't know if I can afford the clothes. I don't know if you're going to be able to make it. On the, I mean, look at my, I mean, I have a fixed income. You think God don't love seniors? You'd be wrong about that. God is not tied to a social security check. He's not tied to a check from whatever company you come from. It sure ain't tied to whatever government money you get. Hallelujah. God is God. And unless you restrict him with your words and unbelief, hey man, there is nothing he can't provide for you. Jehovah God is more than enough. And he can supply your needs if you're open to listen to receive and keep reading those. He gives you the formula by which that takes place. Amen. Take no thought saying, first of all, watch your mouth. Because what you say reinforces your thoughts. That's why that number four there in faith is important. Take no thought by saying, watch your mouth. I ain't got one thing to say, praise God. That is, God will supply for this ministry and for the people in it. Supernaturally, if need be. Take no thought saying, what we going to eat? What we going to drink? Wherewithal shall we clothe? After all these things, the people who don't have a covenant and don't know God seek. For your heavenly Father, he's the Father. We gave praise today to fathers because these fathers in this room, praise God, have taken care of their children. I know mine did. The fathers, praise God, made sure to teach their children. Fathers made sure to watch out for their children. But there's a father greater than all of us in the room. He is our heavenly father, glory to God. And your heavenly father, our heavenly father, knows that you have need of all these things. I don't have to tell it. I don't have to say, Lord, look, we don't have. I don't have to tell him. He already knows. Praise God. I'm not informing God. You are not informing God when you complain about something. He already knows. He don't want you to complain. He wants you to praise, he said today. He wants you to praise him to do what? That, yes, he will supply whatever it is you're looking at. Yes, he will supply whatever they're talking about. Yes, he will supply and keep your gas tank full. He'll keep your heat and oil full. He'll keep clothes on your back. Hallelujah. He'll take you through all kinds of economic issues. He 
is my father. Hallelujah. I am his son. Glory to God. I look out for my boy and my girls, and our heavenly father looks out for you. He knows you have all these needs, but that's the big one right there. Circle, underline, put a star here. Praise God. Amen. Highlight it, whatever you do. But, but here's the fine print to this contract. First, see God's kingdom. See God's ways of doing things. See God's way of thinking, talking, living. Make sure you are not going opposite God. Make sure you are going with God. Don't, praise God, support things that are opposite God. Support things that God said out of the way it's supposed to be. You love people who get over in the sin, but you do not get over in sin with them. And you don't support their sin. Are you listening to me? Glory to God. Seek first the kingdom of God and seek his, Jesus, righteousness. The only way that happens is 1 John 1, 9. If we acknowledge our sin, it says, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We live as holy as we can. And when we miss it, we come before God. He said in Hebrews 4, 16, come boldly because you have a great high priest. His name is Jesus. Come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and then find grace that will help you when you need it. Because you are his child, you can come to him at any time, day or night. And the first thing you'll run into when you come to God is, he said, my child is here and they're dirty but they've confessed they got in the mud and I now clean them up. And when I'm done cleaning them, oh, they don't even have a speck on them nowhere. Yes, and I'm going to treat you as though you never even got in the mud. <laughs> Come on up, my child. I got power for you. I got money when you need it. I got health when you need it. I have joy when you need it. Whatever you need, I got it for you. And I'll give you help. It'll come from my throne. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then the things shall be added to you. What things? Eat, drink, wear, necessities of life. Last verse, verse 34, I close here. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Amen. Stop getting in, getting out of faith, worrying about stuff that ain't even happened. Well, this might happen. It ain't even happen. It may not happen. And stop worrying about stuff you can't do nothing about. You can't do nothing about it. Why are you worrying about it? Amen. Hallelujah. Stay in faith with things you can't control. Hallelujah. Tomorrow will take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient to the, is the evil thereof. What, what's he saying there? He's saying live one day at a time. Walk in faith that day. Don't worry about tomorrow. Make sure you're righteous for God today. Amen. Pay attention to what you support. You have a choice which way to go. You can be Solomon. And you can go all the way to judgment. Where you have lack and die. Or you can walk with God and have provisions and live. Stand with me, please. Praise God. Let's lift our hands, praise God, and thank God for the word today. Father, we receive your word always. You are God. You are the one that has the wisdom. All honor and glory goes to you. You are the author of all life. We 
bow down to you by bowing down to your word. Thank you for delivering the word to us today. And while every head is bowed and every eye is closed in prayer, no one's moving or walking or talking except the people we have assigned to do certain things. You've not made a decision. And yes, every time you sit in a situation or watch one where what I'm doing and you get to hear, you will make a decision one way or the other. No decision is a decision. If you have not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you not ask him to come into your heart. You not bow down to him in his word. I want to give you the opportunity to do so. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 verse 9, if you would acknowledge with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the highest authority of all. He is higher than the college professors. He's higher than the political figures. He's higher than the talking heads. He's higher than your race. He's higher than your mama and daddy. He's higher than your sisters and brothers. He's higher than your employers. He's higher than everybody. Every knee bows. Every tongue's going to acknowledge one day, Jesus is the highest authority of all. He's the curios. But if you recognize that he is the highest authority of all, believe it in your heart. Say it with your mouth. The Bible said you'll be saved. Verse 10 says, with your heart you believe unto righteousness. And with your mouth, acknowledgement is made unto your own deliverance. I like Romans 10, 13. It says, whosoever, that includes everybody, shall call on the authority of the Lord, shall be saved. So if you've not done this, I want to pray with you today. Then there might be some of you who may say, well, I am born again, but I've fallen away from God. But don't be like Solomon. Be like David. The Bible says, praise God, a good man falls down seven times and gets back up again. Get back up. Hallelujah. Come to your father. He will cleanse you and he will treat you as though it never happened because he's good. But you got to come back to him. And you have to acknowledge to him, yeah, I missed it. Amen. Then there might be people here who say, well, you know, I, I haven't received that baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit you've been talking about. I'm even writing a book on it right now. It'll be out in a few months. Hallelujah. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost according to Acts 2, 4, speaking with tongues. You need to accept everything God offers the body of Christ. Who will you tell God I don't need something? You need everything he makes available unto you, praise God. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost, praise God, with the ability to pray in the Spirit. Amen. With all the benefits that come along with it, today's your day. Finally, there might be someone here that says, you know, I'm looking for a church where the word will be preached uncompromised because I'm not going to compromise it. I don't care if it's only me and Deborah left. Nobody else comes to our church. I'm not going to water down the word. We're going to preach it as it's written. Hallelujah. And if you're looking for a church like that, then Word of Faith may be the right church for you. And we'll be honored to receive you today. And when I call the others forward, you come to, and we'll be glad to receive you brand new in Jesus' name. So if you're not born again, you're not sure, you're out of fellowship with God, coming back to God. You want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit or you want to join up with us while all heads are bowed, all eyes are closed in prayer, including those of you watching me online or on television, wherever you might be. Amen. You say, that's me, I desire prayer. Those of, you in the, those of you in the auditorium, you say, that's me, I desire prayer. Then I want you to lift your hand wherever you are right now, and I'll be glad to pray with and for you. You say, I need to get in on that prayer, and you do. Lift your hand now, praise God, and I'll be glad to pray with and for you. Amen. See a hand right there. God bless you. Praise God. People in the valley, a decision. Amen. No decision is a decision. Make the right decision. Come to God. Hallelujah. Anybody else says, that's me. Pray for me. Hallelujah. Oh, you know, and the Lord sometimes, like with word of knowledge, the Lord has even let me know what people are thinking. You know, there's an individual saying, yeah, but you know, and so and so, this Christian did this, and this Christian did that, and this Christian did this. Let me tell you something. Those Christians who did this and that, amen, will have to deal with God. But that's no excuse for you. Because God will not say to you when you stand before him, because you will, 
He will not say to you, well, I'm giving you a pass because so-and-so discouraged you. Amen. Sorry, it will not work. He's going to ask you, what did you do? Did you receive my son? Did you decide to live? Hallelujah. And he said, you judge not that you be judged. It said with the same judgment you pass out to others. That's the degree of judgment to be passed out to you. So, no excuses. I heard the Lord say that about somebody thinking right now. And the Lord's talking to you and giving you the chance, praise God, to get your eyes off of other people and put your eyes where they're supposed to be upon him. Anybody else who's asked me, pray for me right now. Amen. You have to help me with these TV lights up here. <laughs> Just praise God. Anybody else who's asked me, pray for me. Lift your hand high where I can see it, please. And I'll be glad to pray with and for you in the authority of Jesus. Praise God. All right, you may put your hands down. Listen carefully. If you lifted your hand for prayer or you did not lift them, but you know you should, and you want to get in with prayer with me today, ma'am or sir, I'm going to ask you to do something courageous just like that woman did in 1 Kings 17. I'm going to ask you to step out the nearest aisle. Amen. Leave your belongings with someone you trust. If you have one, if not, bring them with you. And come forward to the altar and let me pray with you. Amen. Those of you on the, in the TV audience or internet audience, I'm going to pray with you too in just a moment. Everyone come now and let's pray. Come on. Use our prayer. Come on. Let's pray now. Come. Come. In the authority of Jesus. Come on. Let's pray. Glory to God. for someone else, praise God. You just got to take the step. It'll be the best decision of your life. The best decision I ever made was coming to the altar, making Jesus Lord of my life almost 50 years ago. Best decision I ever made. And it's going to be the best decision you ever made. Amen. But you got to have a little bit of courage. Amen. I feel led to sing one more time. Praise God. Sing it one more time. Come on. Praise God. about please all eyes are closed in prayer those of you standing at the altar God bless you if you're able I want you to lift one hand towards heaven those here at the altar congregation stretch your hand towards these beautiful folks those of you online you do the same you lift one hand towards heaven or on television lift your hand towards him right now praise God and everyone pray with me out loud from from uh, from your heart with your mouth pray with me now dear Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for me, hung on the cross for me, was put in a grave for me, rose from that grave for me, and he is alive now. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Come into my heart. I accept you as my Savior 
and as the master of my life. I repent of sin. Lord, I'm sorry. I accept your offer of forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. Thank you, Lord, for cleansing me. Thank you, Lord, for receiving me back. Heaven is my home. Jesus is my Lord. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for these who pray with me today. Thank you. They are members of the kingdom of God. They are cleansed and holy before you now. And you have declared them as being righteous. We thank you for it. I ask now, Father, you would strengthen them further. Open their eyes. Give them greater understanding and revelation. Yes, may they be discipled and send them those who will help them. And Lord, we thank you that you provide all their needs. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Everyone in agreement with this prayer said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Give these folks a big round of applause. Amen. That was such a powerful service. God truly knows what we need and when we need it. And I know that everyone out there was blessed by the ministry of that word. Now, I want to say congratulations to everyone that made a decision about Jesus Christ. This is the best decision of your life. And right now on the screen, there's some important information that we ask you to follow. Fill it out in its entirety, and we'll send you a gift that will help you with the next step. Thanks, everybody, for joining, and we'll see you at the next service.